Domenico Ruggiero is the new executive director of We Are Family, a nonprofit organization that provides affirming spaces for the LGBTQI youth. I talk one on one with Domenico for this edition of Quentin's Close Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close Ups on Facebook. Domenico Ruggiero, welcome to the award winning Quentin's Close Ups. Quentin, hello, good morning, and thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, you are the new executive director of We Are Family, which is a nonprofit organization that has been providing um, affirming spaces for the LGBTQI plus youth in the Low Country since 1995. Yes. Yeah, we are 26 years old, and um, it's just really great to be part of uh, this organization and being part of the leadership team. It's been uh, it's been really great. Yeah. Yeah. Who is Domenico right now as executive director? <laughs> Domenico right now as an executive director um, spends way too much time, uh, you know, more, more time than I care to admit writing grants for We Are Family. Um, it's a big part of the job. Uh, so, you know, we are a, you know, grassroots, southern grassroots nonprofit. And we have, uh, you know, five folks on staff. So everybody wears multiple hats to do what we need to do to support the, the LGBTQ youth in, in the low country. And so, um, you know, very much a, a boots to the ground type of organization. But the thing that keeps me particularly motivated and excited about uh, continuing the work of the organization is that, you know, at the core of what we do is we cultivate youth change agents, you know, um, lifting their voices and shifting the culture for a more just and equitable, you know, low country or South Carolina and, and society. And so um, it's it's really exciting. You know, we really are hoping and, and doing what we can to make sure that our queer and trans youth, you know, thrive in, in South Carolina and where they can, you know, lead their communities uh, from a place of authenticity and where they are sort of affirmed for all parts of their identities. Yeah. How is the culture shifting right now? Absolutely. Um, one thing I will say is, you know, uh, you know, you know, we've seen it this past year that um, there are, you know, it's South Carolina and there are very much sort of challenges that, are, you know, our youth uh, systematically or institutionally sort of face. Let's say, uh, let's just talk about like, let's see, you know, the K through 12 setting, you know, we've seen some bills coming down from uh, or proposed bills or, or things coming down from, uh, you know, the state house that would, you know, ban, um, you know, uh, seeking to uh, ban, you know, trans athletes in, in the K through 12 setting. Or recently we've seen something come down that was trying to ban queer themed books, you know, um, and, you know, we all know that, you know, how, South Carolina public education, how it gets sort of ranked in the country, and we all know about the corridor of shame through the, the I-95 in the state, um, you know, despite, you know, uh, you know, this past year alone with, um, with those, uh, you know, proposed bills, um, you know, I could definitely, you know, say with confidence that our youth are, you know, that tells sort of part of the story, you know, despite all of, of that coming from uh, the state house, you know, our LGBTQ youth are absolutely talented and creative and resilient and really identify and, uh, um, community for themselves and senses of belonging that, uh, you know, uh, really, um, you know, inspires me to continue the work because, you know, they are absolutely resilient in the face of some of these larger structural challenges. Absolutely. What are the other structural challenges for the LGBTQI youth in South Carolina? Um, other things that, that, uh, you know, come up, come top to mind for me is, you know, um, uh, making sure that, you know, my goodness, it's not, definitely not, I wouldn't be a conversation with you without sort of just acknowledging sort of this past two years with the, the COVID pandemic, you know, our youth are feel much more sort of, you know, uh, isolated, like socially isolated than, you know, than ever before. I think all youth <laughs> do, have had uh, in this past two years. And so I know that, um, 
particularly for, you know, LGBTQ um, and specifically, you know, transgender or gender nonconforming youth, you know, that not having sort of, you know, a community in the same ways or, or feeling sort of isolated that we, we know that that leads to, you know, um, some uh, uh, risks of uh, decreased sort of health determinants. Um, one of the programs that we are really proud to have launched, um, and this is coming from sort of, you know, what our youth are saying we want, we need, um, we launched this past April was our mental health assistance program. And that provides um, our LGBT youth in low country free um, mental health, um, you know, access to, to therapists. And, um, and I guess today we've logged more than a hundred hours of, um, you know, of uh, 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 mental health uh, through our network of LGBTQ affirming uh, therapists and mental health providers. So um, I'll definitely, you know, that's definitely top of mind for me as well. What is the state of mental health for the LGBTQI youth? I think it's, you know, as with, you know, as with all youth, as you're trying to, you know, um, find community and sense of belonging, um, uh, finding your identity and, and fitting in, you know, um, you know, if you're LGBTQ, there's another, you know, a another sort of layer there, um, LGBTQ identified or earth or, you know, thinking about both your sexuality and gender, uh, gender identity and expression and, uh, you know, presentation. I think that there's, that is sort of another layer of having to negotiate, uh, on top of everything else. I will, I'll say also is, you know, if you are a youth of color, that's an another sort of identity layer, social identity layer that, you know, um, that you have to sort of, you know, uh, navigate. And so, um, yeah, definitely think that, um, for our youth that we serve, um, definitely think that, you know, uh, having access to, you know, um, uh, mental health, um, is absolutely sort of critical and important. Um, another thing I'll just mention, uh, is, uh, another sort of part of a program that we have is, uh, specifically, you know, thinking about our, transgender and gender not conforming youth, uh, you know, uh, our, uh, we have something called closet case thrift store, which is our social enterprise. Um, we're, we're, we're uh, our offices and, uh, closet cases in sort of North, North Charleston, right off of Reynolds. Um, and, um, we provide, uh, gender affirming items, uh, at no cost to any youth in actually in South Carolina who, who requests. And so these are gender affirming items I'm, I'm referring to as, um, we have chest binders or tuck kits or packers that, you know, if you're a transgender youth or gender not forming, those are, you know, uh, uh, really, um, uh, you know, uh, clothing items that, and uh, gender affirming items that is important. And so we, you know, we have youth all throughout South Carolina, you know, apply to it, um, online and we ship out, you know, packages, uh, you know, uh, every month. Yeah. And, and I want to go back early because you say, Hey, as executive director, you've been writing a lot of grants recently. Let me ask you, let me start off from here. Uh, how many individual donors did you have in 2020? Ooh, I don't have the numbers um, right uh, on me at the moment. I could uh, pull it up. Um, but we have a lot of support from the local community here in, in the Tri-County. Um, you know, uh, again, we are a grassroots organization and we couldn't do what we do without the support, the continued support of our, uh, you know, uh, uh, supporters, you know, uh, we have folks who give a few bucks, uh, you know, a month or, you know, or giving Tuesday or, um, uh, give out day, uh, you know, that to, you know, uh, we have some of, uh, you know, consistent, uh, donors who, who give a lot more. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud about for We Are Family is, you know, as an organization, we're very much sort of, you know, grassroots, you know, we aren't the, um, and I can say this because I worked at, uh, uh, Teach for America for a couple of years before coming to, you know, we aren't sort of, you know, the big, large, you know, nonprofits, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, of the country, uh, but we are very much a, a grassroots organization. So, um, we absolutely can do what, uh, the, uh, the extent and the breadth and scope of what we do without uh, community support.
what are your oh yes sir and, yeah of course and, man yeah and what are your organization's challenges today Um, our challenge today is, you know, it's trying to, uh, you know, create our larger goal is, is we want to see LGBTQ thrive in, in the low country and we create sort of the spaces, affirming spaces and programs that, you know, um, that, uh, uh, make sure that that they do um and so one of the uh, I, I would say one of the um uh sort of ch uh, challenges you know in and both opportunities of an organization like we all we are family is you know trying to make sure that we you know try to um sort of sustain and grow, you know, our programs and making sure that our programs are respond to uh, continually sort of, you know, respond to the needs of, uh, the, our youth and, and, and the community, you know? Um, and so we have, my goodness, so our programs and, uh, fall into one or more three focus areas or, or, or buckets. Um, that's leadership development and social support, health and wellness, and then community and advocacy. Mm -hmm. And so within each of those, those uh, buckets, we have like two or three programs. And so like as an organization um, with three full-time staff and, and two part-time staff, you know, we, we run, you know, uh, 10 plus programs. And so the, you know, the challenge there I think is, is, you know, um, and one that I'm learning uh, along is sure. how are we going to sort of sustain all, all of this work, especially for the, for the team and like long-term sustainability of these programs without, you know, in a way that encourages the, the, the team and the staff at We Are Family that encourage them to like, you know, be mindful of your own, you know, self care and uh, and sort of that burnout factor. I think it's a disservice if, if we feel burnt out, you know, in the work uh, uh, supporting our youth, um, you know. And so, yeah, that, I think that's that's a challenge for for uh, for us. How many volunteers have helped strengthen your organization? Mm hmm. Absolutely. So volunteers again. We're a grassroots nonprofit. We have many opportunities uh for folks to volunteer i think our bar volunteer list is nearly 300 uh uh folks and so that's really exciting we have folks who you know um who come to closet case thrift store when they're able to and and you know uh help help uh that that retail space we've got folks who come who um you know give their time and talent and skills during our um social support groups we have four currently um but they come in and and uh you know teach our youth if they're particularly um skilled in talking about sort of you know finances and and you know uh financial planning we got folks who come in and just you know are able to um uh, uh, you know, uh, teach our youth, you know, about budgets and, and things like that. And so, um, we have, uh, uh, again, we, our volunteers are absolutely, um, critical to the work that we do and they give of themselves sort of, you know, uh, their time, uh, generously. Yeah. And I failed to mention actually this early that is, but how do you, how, how have you identified the eternal strengths and weaknesses of your organization yeah um my goodness i uh, it started when uh you know uh i heard about the the role of uh, the position of, of ed and, and they were hiring for it and you know i did my due diligence and sort of you know was able to look through um you know the documents and uh with a fine tooth comb you know things on their websites their you know past impact reports um, and that's definitely, you know, nearly six months into this role, that's definitely something that is, you know, top of mind for me when, as I'm thinking about, um, you know, where to grow the organization and where do strategically, you know, uh, in which areas uh, that uh, we can grow as well as, um, you know, ways that, you know, our board can um, be able to, you know, uh, continue our impact, but, you know, think about things in, in uh, much more sort of sustainable ways. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And let me ask you this. What are those strategic community partnerships? Strategic community partnerships? Yeah, I think that's, you know, you know, 
one of these, you know, as an organ, as a social justice organization supporting youth in the Low Country, you know, we know we don't do our work in a silo. You know, there are many, many fantastic, uh, you know, other uh, fantastic community-based organizations that do um, amazing work, and uh, you know, and you know, it's it's really thinking about you know building these coalitions, finding commonalities in you know our. Um, our organizations and our missions that, you know, that is wanting to, um, make sure, you know, that our youth, you know, are, um, uh, supported and affirmed. And so a couple of the partnerships that come to mind, you know, include both LG other LGBTQ, you know, organizations in, uh, in Charleston. We are very, very, um, we have a really uh, close relationship with both, you know, AFA and Charleston Pride and Charleston Black Pride, um, but also thinking sort of, you know, beyond uh, the LGBTQ organizations and really making sure that um, uh, we are connected to sort of coalitions and in solidarity with organizations that do a whole host of things. So I'm thinking about, you know, um, you know, Metanoia in Charleston and the community uh, we're, we're at there or Charleston Promise Neighborhood, you know, um, making sure that, you know, we can, um, you know, uh, you know, be sort of allies and co-conspirators in, in this work. Mm -hmm. What is that one commonality that matches your organization right now? Hmm. One commonality. Um, I think it's honestly, it is one of the things I'm really excited for uh, about We Are Family and um, uh, we're actively working on both internally with our team as, as well as, as the board is, um, you know, as an, as an organization, as a social justice organization, what does it mean to be, um, uh, you know, hold racial justice sort of values, you know, what does it mean for your family to be an anti-racist organization? And so, you know, we're very much doing, and we are fortunate because we are sort of, you know, smaller and nimble. Um, but, um, I know that a lot of, not just nonprofit world, but, you know, in the corporate world as well is really trying to figure out what does that mean for, for us outside of the sort of, you know, DEI, you know, sort of verbiage and, and buzzwords. Um, but, you know, what does that mean for uh, sort of internally in the way that we um, that we fundraise in the way that we um, you know uh, uh, really try to bring up issues of you know equity within our board within our staff meetings within the way that we sort of communicate in uh, you know um, over social media or X Y and Z and so I. Um, I, in the coming year, I'm very much interested in doing that nitty gritty work <laughs> with, uh, internally with the team and, um, and then being able to, in my hope and, and goal is to sort of leverage that as a, this is what it means for your family to say that we are sort of an anti-racist organization. This is sort of the, the pivots and, um, the, um, changes that we've made as, a, as an organization, you know, let's, let's make that as a call to action for other organizations similar to sort of, you know, we are family in our size and, and our scope. Um, to, to do the same type of work. Mm -hmm. What changes have you all made within your organization that other organizations are emulating? Um, ooh, um, I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, you know, I think I'm still, uh, you know, again, nearly six months in. And so, um, one thing that I, you know, will absolutely say is that, you know, uh, compared to other parts of, you know, the region or even the state, uh, you know, uh, I will say that the Charleston area and the low country area is, is such a, um, uh, such a, much more of a, uh, you know, uh, a place where I know that LGBTQ folks here are just, you know, can thrive, uh, you know, I'm not saying that there aren't any sort of problems or issues, you know, in, in the day to day, but, you know, I, I definitely think that compared to, you know, some of the, you know, rural parts of the state, we're, we're fortunate to, to live in an area where, uh, folks can, uh, you know, uh, sort of be out and about and, uh, and, and that makes me very happy, you yeah. know? And, and let me go back to the youth. I know that the 2020 theme for the Spirit Week was Queer Youth Fest and featured a variety of events highlighting the role of art and queer and trans resilience. What is that role today? 
Absolutely. One of the great things that I really loved about our Spirit Week was, um, so uh, as a little bit of background, sort of Spirit Week is, uh, you know, it's the one time a year where we, uh, it's one of our signature programs and it's uh, being able to really um, center, you know, um, in the Cape Thrall setting, uh, you know, center, um, you know, anti-bullying is, is sort of the, the big theme every year uh, for for that or the reason why we have a spirit a spirit day or spirit week um and we had a really fantastic one of the events that made me very uh, two events actually uh, through that that made me very very happy was we had a, a virtual um open mic night um and so we've had um all of our uh, you know a bunch of youth you know come in and being able to share their their talents with with each other, you know, everything from sharing art to uh, spoken word poems, and um, somebody played the drums, you know, uh, and so being able to sort of share that in, in sort of community was um, was great for me, uh, you know, uh, uh, leading the organization, um, and then the second uh, event that I think. Uh, uh, really sort of highlights what's possible um, uh, and um, is that we had an intergenerational panel. Uh, again, it was sort of virtual, but we've had folks from, you know, uh, I would say like, you know, the boomer sort of, you know, uh, generation. And then we've had, um, you know, our youth um, and really just having an upfront conversation of some just life lessons, uh, you know, learned through, um, you know, uh, uh, how to sort of, you know, live, uh, an authentic life and, uh, finding your, your people, your, your, um, your community. Um, and that to me was absolutely special and started to also, uh, for a couple of reasons, um, uh, being able to, I don't think we model in a way to have really fantastic, like intergenerational sort of, you know, conversation and dialogue, you know, in the community. Um, and so that sort of, uh, was really a treat. And then also we, it was really nice for folks to start breaking down some of those barriers that we sort of, that, that sort of get, gets placed on us because of like our age. And like, if you're a boomer, it means, this must mean that, you know, if you're a Gen Z, it must mean that, you know, um, you're stereotyped in X, Y, and Z sort of way. And so it was just really nice to, uh, bear witness to, um, our, you know, our youth and, you know, other LGBTQ folk just, you know, uh, talking about their commonalities and experiences and, and breaking down sort of, you know, those, those barriers and those stereotypes. Yeah. I feel to mention this too, or actually this, actually this as well, uh, Domenico, but let me ask you, what are those barriers that your organization wants to break down in those rural communities who have a longstanding tradition of not, you know, obviously supporting, you know, the LGBTQ youth? Yeah, I think honestly, it's, 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 um, I'd rather, you know, I, I like the idea of, of, um, you know, in, in the, the idea of being able to sort of change hearts and minds, you know, it's being able to, um, uh, one, you know, not try to, you know, stereotype in, in each other in, in, based upon identities, but also just, you know, having, um, you know, moments of, uh, being able to, uh, you know, focus on what are the, the commonalities and the experiences that we have and what are our shared, um, visions and goals, you know, um, for ourselves and, uh, you know, and, and our communities. Yeah. I think yes. that's, a, that's the perfect place to, to begin because there's no doubt in my mind that there are much more, you know, uh, similar, you know, interests and, um, sort of values there than, than otherwise. And where do you go next? Yeah. So let's see what's next. 2022 is right around the corner. Um, and you know, just keep chugging along and doing the work and, um, I'm really excited to be able to, um, work with the board and the staff in the new year, in the a couple months of the new year to really, you know, hammer out our, um, strategic priorities and, um, and our plan for 2022. I've got my thoughts and I'm really excited to hear about all of their thoughts and, um, being able to, you know, continue the work in the, in the coming year. It's, it's critical work and it's important work, but it's, um, it's absolutely fulfilling. What transgender and gender non-conforming support and actualization programs are available within your organization? 
Absolutely. So as a LGBTQ organization, we really try to center the voices of the most marginalized, uh, you know, experiences or identities uh, in, in our community. And that um, absolutely means that a lot of our programs do center um, trans uh, youth uh, and gender nonconforming youth, you know, in our programs. And so what comes to mind is um, something called, we have something called the Trans Love Fund, and it's a micro grant. Um, to, that provides um, funds for trans folks all throughout South Carolina. It doesn't, and it's also uh, not um, uh, not just for youth. All trans folks in South Carolina can apply to this, and it's just micro grants that, that helps with, you know, uh, a medical bill that you received, or food, or paying electric, you know, your your, your bills. And so um, that's one way that we sort of we center those experiences and voices. Um, uh, you know, the same thing with the, our uh, gender affirming gear sent to, you know, uh, uh, queer and trans uh, youth um, all throughout South Carolina. And so, yeah, I definitely think as an organization, we definitely um, uh, want to and uh, continually sort of center the most marginalized identities and voices in our community. Because once those uh, folks are able to, you know, um, uh, gain sort of the resources and and experiences to thrive, we all will. Mm -hmm. What are those resources? What do you mean? Well, yeah, what you just mentioned, you said resources for those uh, particular people. What exactly are those? And what, what do they need right now? Yeah, I think it's, you know, again, going back to COVID, you know, the Transwell Fund, it's, it's, it is strict resources as in like, you know, like money to pay, you know, to, to pay, pay your bills. Um, but I, I think uh, resources in terms of just, um, I think for um, uh, folks in the community uh, here, uh, being able to, um, I think the, the past two years has really exacerbated some of the inequalities that that uh, existed uh, within our um, within society. Um, I think if you sort of you know throw the, that um, uh, you know uh, COVID in into the mix, I think you know folks are still uh, you know struggling sort of financially uh, you know through uh, across the board and. Um, doing, you know, uh, through our Trans Love Fund, that's, you know, that is the small thing, you know, that we can do to, uh, you know, try to, you know, make a difference and try to make sure that uh, 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 trans and gender non-conforming, you know, uh, folks in our uh, community are, uh, you know, can, um, you know, can, uh, 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 you know, center their experiences and make sure that they get, you know, a, you know, a little bit from us. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What more in inequalities that is have been developed because of COVID for the trans and queer youth? Um, I think for all youth in general, for the LGBTQ is just our programming. You know, we've really had to, as in many organizations, try to figure out what programming looks like. Um, I'll just name, I have a couple more minutes before I have a, another meeting, but um, when we, uh, you know, really learning earlier on what are our programming pivots look like, you know, so we've been around in South Carolina for 26 years and our sort of bread and butter uh, programming is our social support groups. We've had that, you know, since the, you know, uh, that was sort of our first program offerings. And so we have four right now. Um, and, you know, we've definitely, you know, right now we are, are, you know, everything, we turned everything sort of virtual and now we're in sort of a hybrid model, which, you know, one week will be in person, another week will be, uh, you know, virtual. Uh, one of the lessons we've learned from that is, you know, we're still need to keep that virtual component in, in some way or another, you know, once things get back to normal, whatever that sort of that may mean. Um, we've definitely gotten a lot more participants who are on our Discord server or, or meet virtually who can't readily come to our space in, in North Charleston every week. And so um, we, that's definitely, we're definitely sort of gleaning a lot of um, new, uh, newer sort of best practices practices when it comes to our social support groups. What, uh, you know, I want to ask you one last question since you have to run off to this meeting, but let me ask you this, what logistical, what, what logistic regression models for LGBTQI youth affirming spaces that had to be adjusted for gender identity, age, and race efficacy, obviously, while those for the gender affirming spaces had to be adjusted for age and obviously race and ethnicity? 
Um, yeah, I think all of our, we definitely, um, uh, regularly do an intake of, um, how our programs both are, you know, you know, our, the breadth and scope of our programs, you know, reach, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the community and, uh, you know, between, um, both formal and informal sort of assessment methods, you know, uh, our, you know, larger goals and, um, shifts that we continuously make is how are we making sure that, you know, all of our programs, uh, reach the multiplicity of experiences within the LGBTQ youth, you know, um, and, uh, and making sure that the, our programs really, um, sort of impact the, the breadth and scope of, you know, identities within the, you know, LGBTQ community. How yeah. has your organization examined the association between access to affirming spaces and suicide attempts? And suicide attempts. I think, you know, we all know the, you know, the Trevor Project is a fantastic organization that, that provides critical care for LGBTQ folks who are going through some of the, um, uh, you know, critical um, uh, sort of suicide ideation and, and things like that. Um, I think our organization through our mental health assistance program, you know, indirectly or, and or directly is, is being able to, you know, provide, um, uh, our youth with those, you know, fantastic mental health therapists and clinicians who, who are able to, you know, meet with them weekly. Um, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I want to get you back on Quentin's close-ups in 2022 because I got some more questions for you. But Domenico Gregorio, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to the award-winning Quentin's close-ups. Quentin, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I really hope I get the chance to connect with you soon. Thank you so much. I appreciate it greatly.